Nope. I don't don't have that ability. It it's one of those unfortunate things. And we get nasty glare off of these windows too. And today's an overcast day, so the glare will be even worse. But it's the room that I'm given, so I don't I don't get a lot of choice. So um, today we're going to lecture on something that's kind of peripherally related to the world of architecture, but I think it's kind of important to talk through a bunch of stuff. And these are things that I think are important. It's the first week. You guys are all shaking out. We don't need to do anything too serious yet. Next week you'll come in and we're going to start in the digital photography section. We'll start in uh, Photoshop on Wednesday, but on, on Monday you guys are actually going to go take some pictures uh, so that you have some stock to work with. Uh, so we'll really get the ball rolling then. But until then, I do want to kind of get a general overview of technology, of the things that we're using, of the internet, et cetera, because I think it's important to have some, some baseline that we can all communicate on. Obviously, I'm asking you guys to use the course website, and I want to kind of talk about why and the organization of your life, uh, trying to make your lives a little bit better. I used to give this one at the end. Uh, and decided that it was far better to talk about how you organize your digital files before we start rather than at the end. So you get it today, uh, and we're going to go through technology, design, and architecture as an overview. OK, I don't need hints. I just need you to move the slide. So let's start with organizing your digital life. So how do we organize our files, keeping the chaos at bay? How many people on their desktop at home have like 100 icons? Oh, good. Everybody's saying no. That's good. There's, there's one person, right? My dad's notorious for this. I go to his computer. It's like, oh, God. Anyway, so there's two different ways of organizing your files. The first way of organizing your files would be a flat or a fat file system, which essentially means you have a big folder, let's say your documents folder, and inside of that folder, you put all your stuff. The most basic way is documents, I save everything into documents. Or desktop, I save everything into the desktop. Then you know where everything is because it's all in that one folder. You never put it anywhere else. But it's also really hard because you might have 100, 200, 1,000 files, 2,000 files. You have all those files in one place. It's hard to find anything. Maybe you break it down a little bit further. Maybe you break it down by file type. You know, so if I'm working in Illustrator, then all of the, uh, all the files in Illustrator go into an Illustrator folder, something along those lines. Advantages and disadvantages of this scheme is Oh, I'm working in Illustrator. I'm working in Word. All my Word files are in the same place. Well, I'll just keep looking. Eventually, it'll be in that folder somewhere. So that's not a bad strategy. It's certainly easy to find files of a specific type. Oh, I know I typed my English paper. It must be in the Word folder. I'll look for the Word file in there. OK, so maybe it has an advantage there. It's kind of diff difficult, though, to keep projects separate. Let's say you write lots of English papers. And then you move on to the next semester, and you write more English papers. Well, how do you know which English papers were the first class, the second class, which paper did you write? It's just an organizational nightmare. It means your folders are really large, lots and lots and lots of files in the same folder. And you have to just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Eventually, you find it. So perhaps there's a better system. And certainly, I might say a hierarchy might work a little bit better for you. So if we think about that in context, maybe you can organize your life such that you don't have this big dump of files in one place. So let's say you had your documents folder. Okay, I picked the documents folder as the root, though we're increasingly moving to some folder called cloud or OneDrive or something along those lines because everything's syncing to the cloud. So maybe documents isn't the right first folder. Maybe it's cloud instead. We move into there. Maybe it's a good idea to keep your school files separate from your personal files. Maybe you have a job and you keep the work file separate. That's nice. So we break it down into broad stroke categories. Then maybe we get a little bit more specific. Inside your school folder, maybe you have an Architecture 135 folder. That's what you're working on in this class. All your stuff in this class gets in that. You're in 121. A lot of you raised your hand saying you were in 121. Maybe you have a 121 folder. It's where you keep all your 121 stuff. It starts to develop this organization <coughs> scheme. Inside your 135 folder, maybe you have folders for assignments. Maybe you have folders for exercises. Maybe you have one folder for every exercise that we do. That's a good way of keeping organized. All your files for one project or one thing that you're doing go into the same place. This is particularly useful when we get into InDesign. You guys haven't talked about um, or, or looked at InDesign much. InDesign has a reference file structure. We reference other files. If you keep them in the same place, we don't lose the files. It's really simple. Advantages and disadvantages of this kind of a system, a hierarchical system, 
is that they're organized by project. I'm working on a particular design project, I can always go back to that particular project. Works great down the road in studio. Let's say you move on and you're at Berkeley and you're starting to work on these projects. Maybe in a given studio you might have two, maybe three projects that you're going to work on. You can name your project. Oh, this is the, uh, you know, the house. This is the whatever. You know, this is the library. Well, then every file that you've worked on is in that library folder. Okay, I was in grad school more than 10 years ago, but I could still go back to my folders where I have my stuff and find all my thesis stuff because it's all in my thesis folder. I could go back and find my comprehensive studio project all in that folder because that's where I stored them all. So it's really easy to go back and find your files later on. It's easy to keep your project separate too because they don't get mixed together, don't get all shuffled up. You can always perform a smart search where you're looking for all files that are Word documents, for example. So you can get the other type of folder out of this if you really need it. If you know that you created an English paper, at some point it was a Word doc and you can't find it, and you don't really remember what it was, you could do a search for .doc or .docx for the, the Word file type, and you could find a folder with all of those in it if you really needed to find it that way. So it kind of gives you the best of both worlds. How about for your flash drive in the lab? Okay, I told you guys all needed a flash drive today. Now's your time to set this up. You might have your root of the flash drive, right? And by root of the flash drive, I just mean that's that's where you, you know, dump your, that's, that's the base of your, your flash drive to begin with. And then I would say you probably need a folder called OneDrive or something like that. And then you might take a second folder called Resources. And the idea here is that your OneDrive folder is the one that's going to be backed up. We're going to talk about backup in a second and making sure that you have a backup of your files. But that OneDrive folder is what you want to store all the files that you need backups of. So you're working on an exercise, you're working on an assignment, that should go in this folder because you want that to be backed up. The resources folder, on the other hand, that one, that's stuff that's reproducible. So you download a bunch of materials for V-Ray. You can go in the resources folder, you can download them again. No big deal. So it's something that you can get again. I need a particular image file, oh, I found it online, I can get that image file back if I lose it. Yeah, no big deal because it's a resource. Maybe it's a font. Maybe you downloaded a special font for your poster. That would go in the resources folder. Okay. Then beyond that, maybe you have a folder for 135. And then inside of that, maybe it's assignments, exercises. When we do the final portfolio, maybe it goes there, et cetera. You can, you can play around with that as we go forward. Naming your world. So, Sometimes you write your English paper and you're working on it. And you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm in a hurry. I got to run to class. I'm late. Save. Saves as untitled. Okay? How many people have done that before? A few times, right? Well, guess what? The next day, you write another paper. This one's for your, your history class. And you're in a hurry too. And you save it. And it's called Untitled 2. And then you say, oh no, you know what, I'm going to screw around, I'm going to go up and go skiing for the weekend, I'm not really going to work on it. And then you come back the next week and you go, wait a minute, what did I save those files as? Was it Untitled 1 or Untitled 2 or Untitled 15 or Untitled 20? Because you have this habit of doing it. So instead, what if we developed some kind of a scheme that allowed you to name your files so that you always knew what the files were? So I'm going to show you what I did, and it doesn't mean it's the right thing. And so I'm up here, you know, let's say preaching. This is how you should do it. This is how you should organize your stuff. It doesn't mean it works for everybody. You know, it might not work for you, but it might help. Maybe one thing that I talk about today will actually sink in and you'll do it. Hopefully that'll be the backup part. That's the one that's really important, but we'll get to that. So at least I'm going to talk about it so that you guys can get a sense for how this might work. So in my world, I put a prefix, so something that goes in front of all the files for a particular project has some kind of a prefix on it. So it's easy to know, oh, these are all belonging to a particular class, for example. And I'll speak specifically to your classes right now as opposed to your, your personal files or your work files or whatever. But in this context, let's say you're in 121. A bunch of you said you were in 121 right now. So what I would do is I would say, you're in 121. It's an architecture class, so we start with A. Then we get 121, which is the course number. 
And then I followed it with the first name or the, the first letter of the last name of the professor who taught it. Now you guys are saying, wait a minute, I'm only taking 121 once. I'm not taking multiple 121s. It doesn't make any difference. Why do I have to do that? Truth is, you don't at this level. But let's say you, you go forward in your architectural career or your design career, and you end up in your master's program. Well, in your master's program, you might take a studio that's a 201 studio, for example, and you might take it three times with three different people because that's what the level of studio you're in. That would be an option, too, at Berkeley. You would take 201 three times. Well, you have to have some way of differentiating what 201 you're in. I mean, I guess closer to your world, let's say you took uh, 121 and you didn't do well and you withdrew, and then you went to take it again. Well, how do you keep that first round separate from the second round? So you might have a different identifier on it. So in this case, this goes in front of anything that you're working on. Then I put something at the end. Now, the stuff in the middle, I don't care about. You can put whatever you want in the middle. But then I put something at the end. And in this, I put an addition and a version. And so for the addition and for the version, I'm going to change to red so you guys can see this a little bit better. The addition is major changes. It's right there. So this is something you, a lot of you probably do. Right? You, you're working on a particular project, you do a save as, and you call it whatever it is, 02, or whatever it is, 03, because you want to make a big change. And you're not sure you want to commit to that big change, because maybe your professor won't like that, and you want to go back to the one before. This happens. I get it. I've been in there. I still do it. Okay? So that's big change. Big change happens at the addition level. That's the one that you number. That's the one that you say uh, you know, 02, 03, 04, et cetera. But then you might have a little bit more fine tune. Let's say we're doing a, a V-Ray rendering of your final project. And I know this isn't for you guys. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe another example would be you're doing a Photoshop collage of your, um, you know, one of the elevations or the sections of your SketchUp model at the end of this class. Okay? And you might do something, and you might turn on some lighting effects, or, or you might do a little bit of soft light uh, mm -hmm. blending mode or whatever. You do, a save, you do a save as, you find the JPEG, you collapse it all, you look at it, you say, no, that wasn't quite right, I need a little bit more. So you just add this A, B, C, D at the end, it's the same addition, it's just a different version as you're fine tuning it. And it always lets you go back and say, oh no, I put too much light in, or something like that. Do you have to do this? No. But it's a way of differentiating big changes from small changes as you start working with your files. So combined, oops. So combined, you'd have the A121A. This is 121. And at the end, you'd have your addition and your version. And then whatever happens in the middle, you can name it whatever you want. A couple other notes about file names. Anybody ever noticed when they went to, uh, online to download a PDF and the, in the web browser, there's a bunch of weird characters. There's like percents and stuff in it. Okay? The reason that those characters exist is because in the web, or on the web, we can't have spaces. File names can't have spaces. So when you upload a PDF and it has spaces in it, there has to be a placeholder for this means space. So they put a few extra characters in there. So you end up with that. If you, on the other hand, put underscores or dashes instead of spaces, you won't have all those weird characters in it. So it's a little bit cleaner. Does it really matter? No. If you're keeping your file just on your computer, putting spaces in is just fine. Won't hurt anybody. All our modern operating systems can handle that. So it's just something to be aware of if you're going to be uploading the files. Try to eliminate the spaces if you can. Do the underscores or the dashes. Stay away from other characters, slashes, question marks, or periods. Those all have meaning in computer code. So if you suddenly throw a question mark in, it's looking for a variable, typically. If you throw a period in, it's looking for an extension. You guys all know that I have a, uh, let's say I have a photo file and it ends in .jpg. It's a JPEG file. Okay? If I have something that ends in, I'm doing, I'm making this up, you know, myfile.doc.jpg. Well, the computer's confused. Is it a Word file or is it a JPEG file? I don't know. So we, we want to keep away from those little periods because it can run into trouble long term. You guys probably already know this anyway. So I told you the most important thing I was going to talk about today is backup. How many people regularly back up their computer files? OK, so out of 33 people in this room, two people raised their hands. That's really scary. 
really scary. So we're going to see if we can change that today to make your lives a little bit better. Okay? So I borrowed this set of principles from a multimedia guild of artists in San Francisco called the Pixel Core, and they tell you that your files are not safe unless you have three copies of your files. Three. Not one, not two, three copies of your files. You should have the one primary copy that you're working on, and you should have two backups. Okay, so we started with three. I told you backup, three, two, one. We started with three. Three copies of your file. Next, two different mediums. This is a little fuzzy than it used to be. If we, if we rewind the clock eight years, we had these things called CDs or DVDs that you could like burn your files to. And now we don't do that anymore. So it's a little, little different. The idea here is that you should have your files on two different types of storage devices. So maybe it's on a spinning hard drive and a solid state hard drive. Maybe it's in the cloud somewhere on somebody else's hard drive and it's on your hard drive at home. Two different, two different types of media. The idea here is that let's say you have a flash drive. It has no moving parts. That's good. It's not susceptible to magnets. That's also good. Okay, So you have one file, and it's on that flash drive, and you happen to go through a big magnetic field that's going to erase drives. Not that we do that on that often, but let's say that hypothetically. OK, that's good. Your flash drive's safe, but your other hard drive died because it went through the magnetic field. OK, well, let's flip it around. What if you store it on a hard drive, and you store it on a flash drive, and your flash drive goes through the wash? Well, chances are the hard drive's bigger. It's not going to go through the wash. So your hard drive's safe in that case, but you fried it on your flash drive because it went through the wash. Although I've had flash drives go through the wash quite successfully many times. But they don't always work. Okay? Maybe you have your flash drive plugged into the uh, front of the computer, and you turn your chair, and you break the flash drive off. This has happened in my class. Okay? Actually, it's happened at least once, maybe twice. <clears throat> okay? That's a problem. If you had a hard drive with a cable, you wouldn't do that. So having the two different types of media is a really good idea. Okay, So we're going to strive for that, because any media can fail. So one other story about failing stuff. Well, I'll tell it after the next slide. One copy of that file. So we have three copies, two different media, two different locations. One of those should not be with you, personally. Off-site, away, gone. That's what we want. So three copies, two mediums, one not with you. The idea here right, is that the, you have one copy that's not with you. It's not susceptible to the things that you're going through. It's safe somewhere else in some server farm somewhere. It's up in the cloud. Okay. So a couple stories. I have lots of stories of this, because every semester, okay, there's 33 of you. Somebody will lose all their data this semester. It's going to happen. The question is, will you survive or not? Okay. So I tell you that right now. One of you is going to lose all your data this semester. Okay. Listen, listen, I'm telling you that. Okay. Guess what? Three, four, four semesters ago, five semesters ago, that person was right here. Okay, so I'm up here talking about it, and guess what? I was the victim that semester. So in this particular case, I was, it was before I moved my office over here. I was in my office over there. Semester had actually finished. I had finished the final grades. You guys had all eaten your donuts. Life was great. I was sitting down at my computer about an hour after class, ready to submit those final grades, hit the submit button. Sweet. Life is great. Going to get ready for the next class. Hard drive dead. Not dead like, oh, I lost your startup file, and maybe I can be repaired. Like dead as in, it was a doorstop. Like not recoverable, won't spin, bye-bye. Period. Gone. OK, so in that circumstance, okay, I was really lucky because I had submitted the grade, so I didn't have to worry about that part. But in that circumstance, think about it. Think about if that happened to you. It's your personal computer. It's all your stuff on it. What happens? So I'm up here talking about backing up. Do you think I had a backup? Yes. yes, I did. Do you think I had a backup that was current to right before my computer died? Yes, I did. 
So I took my computer, I flipped it over, I popped the hard drive out, I tossed that one, went and got a new hard drive, stuck it in, all my data came back on, life was good. Didn't lose one thing. Okay? Pretty cool. So fast forward a year. I'm telling you these stories to, to show you that this happened. Fast forward a year. I'm with my, my daughter and my son. We're all in my truck. And we got we were, we were picking out our Christmas trees. So we were, we were at this place up in Placerville. We we're picking out our Christmas trees. It was cold. And my daughter's like, you know, Dad, I really want hot chocolate. I'm like, hey, cool. Like, this is a fun day. It's a weekend. Like, great. You know, nothing, no problem. Get hot chocolate. It's in the center cup holder. All is good. OK, let's go out. Let's, let's find the tree. You know, it was about, she drank like half of it. You know, I mean, she's six. Or at that point, she was probably five. You know, they did half. That's good. Just leave it in the cup holder. No big. No big. Didn't think about it. Left my golden retriever in the truck, too. No big. Yeah, whatever. We go cut down the Christmas tree. Come back. My golden retriever climbed from the backs into the front, managed to knock the cup of hot chocolate out of my cup holder, upside down directly into my laptop bag that was open. The vents of my computer were facing up. So I got the entire cup of hot chocolate into my computer. Not like into the bag, like directly into the computer. It happens, and it will happen to you, OK? So in that context, that was a lot worse, because I didn't just get to pop the hard drive out. That was called, well, that computer's toast, so maybe we'll get a new one. <laughs> so the point is that this kind of stuff does happen. And I tell you these stories because they're kind of funny, OK? But at the same time, if, you, if I didn't have a backup, there's two times that I would have been totally screwed, OK? So think about it. No, you know, a couple of you raised your hands and said you back up, and the rest of you said you don't. What happens when that cup of hot chocolate goes on your laptop? What happens when you're working late at night and you accidentally move and sweep your coffee over the keyboard? Right? It's gonna happen. I'm just saying. So, so I actually, in, in this particular, we're going to talk about backup in a second. In this particular case, I'm a little security conscious. We'll get to that a little bit later on. So I actually run my own server with my own backup uh, that's, that's always running. So there are, there are other solutions if you don't want to you know, have something that extreme. Yeah, that, that will take care of it. Uh, but the idea is that I always have something off-site. It's always backed up to that off-site location. So for you, this is a good question. You're in the computer lab right here. And if the power were to go out, would you have a backup? If you had a flash drive, you'd have your most recent save. That's pretty good. But it's not quite the perfect solution. So what do we do? You plug in your flash drive into the computer. You have your primary working copy. There's one copy of your file. So we've satisfied that, at least. Okay? We're going to connect it to your OneDrive account, probably your school OneDrive account, because it's a 25 gig account, which should get you through the semester OK. You'll back up your one copy into that cloud. So now we've satisfied there's two copies, and they're in two different locations. One is in the cloud. That's great. So we have that pesky third copy still to satisfy. So what do we do? We go home, and on your home computer, you install OneDrive, and you connect it. So when you save your work here, it uploads to the cloud, and then it also uploads to your computer at home. So you now have three copies, two different locations, on two different medium, one, one off-site um, and two different medium. You just solve that 3-2-1 backup. Pretty easy. Now, the other thing about backups is they need to happen off-site, and they also have to happen without you thinking about them. So if you have to go home every night, oh, I'm going to back up my files every night when I get home. I'm going to take my laptop. I'm going to plug it into my hard drive. Sweet, I got this. Well, you know, one night, you'll be like, oh, I'm really tired. My girlfriend asked me to go out for drinks, so maybe I'll go have some drinks. And then you get home, oh, you know, I just don't feel like doing it tonight. OK, well, there's one missed night. And then you, the next night, you stay here, and you work really late. And you get home, and you're like, oh, you just can't do it, and you fall asleep. And then the next night, you go over to a friend's house, and you're not at your house, and maybe you stay overnight over there. Well, suddenly, you're four, five, six days behind, and you haven't ever backed up. So it needs to happen without you thinking about it because you'll forget to do it or you put it off. So it just needs to be automatic. So we, you talked about what are the options. If you have your own computer, 
You can run Time Machine or Windows File Backup. Both are built in. Those work fine. You dedicate a hard drive. A lot of times, you can have a network attack storage to your home network. So all your computer has to do is be attached to your home network, and it will do the backup for you. So Apple, for example, sells a router with a hard drive in it, and you can back up your stuff to that, should you want to. That's, that's just included. Okay? But there are aftermarket solutions depending on what you want to do. These are a little bit more fine tuning if you want to have more control over what's backed up and how frequently it's backed up. There are different options up here. There, I'm not specifying one being better than the other, um, some of which will back up folders or groups of folders. Uh, Super Duper, for example, which is a Mac product, will actually make an exact copy of your hard drive. So if you wanted to switch from one hard drive to another, you could make an exact copy, including all the system files and whatever. So depending on what your, your use is, any one of these might be helpful. These aren't particularly good at off-site backup. These are your off-site backup options. Dropbox is great. It works great. You either have to pay for the big account, or you have to refer a bunch of people to get a bigger account. So as a student, you, uh, you can't get, I mean, you start with two gigs, and then you can like refer your friends and sign up with other emails and whatever, and you can eventually get a little bit more space. I think my account, after 10 years of having a Dropbox account, is like 20 gigs or something from referrals and, and whatever. So you can do that, but you're kind of limited in, in space. Uh, Google Drive, if you have a Gmail account, you can get 15 gigs for free. It works pretty well on your home computer if you're in your own world. Working at it, I've tried. There is no good solution for connecting your Google Drive to a flash drive in the lab. It just doesn't really work. We don't have the rights on the computers to be able to do it. So OneDrive is Microsoft's version of this same thing. Um, it works really nicely with Windows 10, which all of these computers are Windows 10, so that's a good thing. Um, you as a student with a DVC email account will get 25 gigs for free, which is pretty decent space. Um, so that's what I would encourage you to use, uh, and that's what we'll talk about using with your flash drive a little bit later on. Uh, and it works pretty well. Uh, Carbonite is another solution. It's, it costs a little bit more. It's 50 bucks a year. But this would be, if you don't want to think about it, if you sign up for that and you pay for your 50 bucks, your computer's just always backed up, and you don't have to worry about it. So um, that's a great solution if you don't want to spend too much time working on it. The one that I use that we talked about uh, briefly before is called OwnCloud. It's essentially uh, a, an open source software package that you can run on a server that will let you create your own cloud. It has all the same syncing stuff that everything else does. The caveat here is you have to pay for a server somewhere to host it for you. But in my case, I actually own the server somewhere and can handle it. Or I pay for the server. It's my data. Nobody else has access to it. To it. To it. It's all encrypted, et cetera. Yeah. It just depends on do you trust Google or Microsoft or Dropbox or anybody else. So in this, in this instance, the only, the only link that I have um, in my trust loop is I pay for my server. And I'm assuming that the company is going to stay in business and provide the server. Beyond that. I have 100% root access to my server, and they don't. So all I'm paying for is essentially the box that's stored remotely, uh, or I'm renting the box stored remotely. They don't have any access to anything. So if I lose my passwords or whatever, that's my problem. Um, so to me, this is the most secure option if you're really security conscious. Um, it also means for me that I can have a lot more space. I can have as much space as I want to pay for. So that's what I do, but it doesn't mean it's the right thing. And it's because you know I run a business, and I, I have other accounts that are associated with it. It makes sense for what I do. So backups need to occur, I mean, ideally, by the minute, right? or by the hour, at least by the night. You know, Then you still want to start thinking about the week. And you can tell where this is going, the month. And here's a good one. How about at the end of the semester? So this is a great opportunity for you to take Something and I know those th those disc things, those DVDs are like really old school technology, right? But this is actually a good use for them. You could burn out if you could find one that has a burner in it, um, because the laptops don't anymore. You could burn out a disc, or you could put it on a hard drive, and you could store it somewhere. For this is all my work for the semester. And when you go back to do your portfolio in two years, and you want to go back to that Mondrian museum that you did, and you want to be able to drop that into your portfolio, you know where to find that stuff, and you don't have to worry about finding it. So that can be useful. And then obviously, yearly, et cetera. So 
I bring out one more, one more story, one more side story, and that is off-site peace of mind. And we talked about backing up to the cloud, which is obviously a good thing. But let me tell you another story. Okay, so this story is about my wife. She grew up in the Central Valley. She grew up in Yuba City. And uh, she was in high school, and she was, uh, she was abroad. I think she was in Germany at the time. And she got a call from her stepdad, and her stepdad said, um, yeah, so the levee's going to break, and it's either going to flood Marysville or Yuba City. What do you want out of your room? You have an hour. So think about that. What if you got a phone call that said you had an hour to take whatever you wanted out of your house? What would you take? What's that important to you? Right? Yeah. It did. It did actually happen a year ago. She wasn't living there at the time, but it, the same thing happened, right? So you want to think about that. Would you lose anything critical? I mean, obviously, you'd take your, you know, your kids and your wife and, you know, I mean, maybe. I don't know. Maybe you wouldn't. I, I would, you know, but maybe you would. But what, what else would you take? What would you grab? And this mental exercise is a good way of understanding what's really important to you. So think about it in the same way in a digital context, right? Let's say your house was going to burn down tomorrow. Are there files that matter? How would you get those files? What would you do? So for me personally, the files that are really important to me are my photos. I have somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 or 60,000 photos um, that I've taken over time. Those are important. You know, wedding files, daughter being born files. I mean, you know, it's kind of a big deal. So my wife's answer at the time when she was in, in, in high school was uh, get my yearbooks and get my photo albums. Those are the top two items. Seems pretty reasonable, right? And it's kind of true today. I mean, I think I'd leave the yearbooks behind, but maybe the photo albums, OK? So what do I do? Because I'm worried about my photos. And I don't do this as often as I should. And this is part of the it's not automated. So it takes effort to do it. But every once in a while, usually once a year, I take all those photos that I have, and I back them up to one of those little external hard drives. We all have them. And then I take it down to my bank. This is ridiculous, right? And I go into the safety deposit box room, and I open up my safety deposit box, and I pull it out, and I look at all the gold bars. No, I don't. <laughs> I pull it out, and I stick my hard drive in there. I nestle it in there with those gold bars and everything. No, there's nothing else in my <laughs> safety deposit box. The bank robbers are going to be so disappointed when they come in and they open mine, oh, it's a hard drive. <laughs> nice. So the point is, I know that that's a safe location. I know if my house were to burn down, I'd still have my photos, because that's what's really important to me. Can I live without the rest of it? Can I rebuild most of it? Sure, sure. So it's a little bit pessimistic. It's a little bit doom and gloom. But at the same time, it's important for you to really think about what is really that important? And how am I protecting that? Have I convinced you guys to back up yet? OK. I, I try. I think that what you said, along with all the natural disasters that have happened, <laughs> are like a good argument. OK. Fair enough. Fair enough. So maybe, maybe we got you convinced that it's a good idea. So let's move on. Let's shift gears. Let's talk about calendars. How many people keep a calendar regularly? OK, good. More of you than backed up. That's good. We're making progress in this. Generally speaking, keeping a separate calendar for your work, for your school, and or for your personal life is not a bad idea. Right? The good news is we all have our phones and we all have stuff that can help us keep track of these things. Right? I can't tell you how many times I had a doctor's appointment scheduled that I would have completely forgot about if my phone hadn't said, oh, guess what? Tomorrow you have a doctor's appointment. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Great. I'll go. It happens. So that's why a calendar is important. If you can subscribe to a calendar, that's even better. So if somebody else makes the calendar and you just say, yeah, give me all that data, awesome. So in this class, for example, I put a calendar together of what's happening, when the due dates are, and that sort of thing. And you guys can all subscribe to that calendar. And if I update it or if I change it, it will change on all of your calendars. Cool system. So if you can do that, it's all the better. The other thing is you want to make sure that your calendars sync across every device that you have. So it should be on your computer, should be on your phone, should be on your iPad. That's an ideal world. So then does anybody keep those book calendars? Okay. So I'm going to pick on you guys for a second, okay? 
And actually, more than I'm picking on you, I'm going to pick on my wife, OK? Because my wife insists that this spiral-bound calendar book thing is like the greatest thing in the world, right? See, I know. See, you guys are like, oh, it is. It is. It's so good, OK? So let me try to convince you why it's not. And that is that it's great and it's awesome for you. But you schedule all these things and you put it in there. This is like husband to wife talk, right? You schedule all these things and you put it in there and you don't tell me about them. So I'm stuck not knowing that any of this stuff is going to happen because it's not on any of my calendars because it doesn't sync with any of my calendars. Sorry, I had to pick on you guys. <laughs> all right? And maybe, maybe you don't have husbands and stuff. Yeah. Well, it, you just have it. Yes, the, the problem is you write it in the book and you don't tell me that it's in the book and then I don't know that it's in the book. And anyway, sorry, that's a tangent. I had, to take, I had to take some of my aggression out on somebody, right? <laughs> I've already tried on my wife. I try to hide it too, like, you know, put it in the cupboard. Like, you don't know where it is, put it on my calendar. No, it doesn't work, she'll find it. Anyway, if it doesn't sync across all of your devices, that's kind of problematic, especially if you're sharing it with multiple people. That can, that can be challenging to keep track of you know, when swimming lessons are or whatever. Anyway, Yahoo, Google, Outlook calendars, they're all great. Chances are all of you have at least one of those addresses, so you can use one of their calendars. And we'll talk about how to do it. Uh, if you're in the Mac world, of course, you can use their iCloud setup, but that locks you into iPhone, iPad, Mac, not so much Windows or Android. So I, I put that up there just as a, as a reference point. And we'll talk about how do you actually subscribe. So guess what? That's a calendar. Wow. You guys aren't even laughing. It's clearly too early in the morning. I've been up too long. Anyway, so this is a calendar. This is what I'm talking about. You can subscribe to this that says, at 8 in the morning, I'm giving a lecture on technology. And then at you know 9 or, or whatever, Today will probably be a little bit later. Uh, we're on to uh, a lab exercise. And this is what the lab exercise is about. And it will populate into your calendar. You can see what we're doing when we're doing it. That's an ideal world. Uh, that's the Outlook version of it. And here's the uh, Yahoo version of it. Email. So how about this? The average person has three email accounts. How many people fall into this category? Three or more? OK, most of you. OK, that's good. Usually one's for, that you give out to your friends and your family. Those are the people you care about getting email from. One is for your work or your school. If it's your work account, you probably check it frequently. If it's your school account, you probably don't. We've all tried that. We've all tried to email on your insight, and you never check it. Um, and then you might have one that you give out to like spammers and stuff, right? The number of emails sent by humanity, and this is, a, this is probably a year and a half old, this slide, so it's probably more than this. The number of emails sent per day is probably over 200 billion right now. That's a lot of email. The average person gets at least 121 emails per day. How many people are average or above average in number of emails? 121, you guys don't get 121 emails? I get like 350 emails a day. Like, are you serious? Good for you. So how do you organize this down? Think about as few emails as possible. You might have that email that you opened when you were 16. Maybe it's time to get rid of that one. Maybe it's time to forward that one into one of your other email addresses so you don't have to keep checking it. That's not a bad idea. Uh, think about which email addresses you really want to use and stick to those email addresses. Right? Sometimes people have old email addresses. They send it to you. It gets forwarded to your new email address. You reply from your new email address, and hopefully they get the idea to update to your new one. That's not a bad idea. Uh, and then enabling spam filters is always a really good idea. Sometimes you lose a few important things, but it's better than all the Viagra ads that you get. Right? So we try to strip that stuff out as best as you can. Now, you have to be careful of this one, because you get an email about go-kart racing. Sweet. I, this happened to me, right? Go-kart racing. Like, yeah. Freaking, I've never been go-kart racing in my life. OK, I have no idea where this email comes. Unsubscribe. Ooh, this is a real email address. Go-kart race, go-kart race. Like 800 more emails. OK, that's bad. So if you don't know where it came from, don't click the unsubscribe button, because it's like confirming, yes, this is a good email address. Keep emailing me. Okay? Now, if you bought something on like Pottery Barn, and they started sending you emails, and you click the unsubscribe, it's going to work because it's a known company. 
Okay? But those weird random ones, don't click the unsubscribe. Just throw it in your spam folder and, and train your email account to always get rid of those for you. So there's forwarding. Uh, if you wanted to, to enable it to connect your email, it's, it doesn't matter. It's available in all the, the various email programs. The other thing that you can do is use an email client that gets through your email quickly. If it's gesture-based, that's great. Spark by Readle is awesome if you use an iPhone or you use an Android phone. It's gesture-based, so you can quickly just say, not important, not important, not important. <clears throat> oh, that one's important. Oh, no, not, 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 et cetera. So it gets you through really fast, rather than you know click, delete, or whatever. So if you can improve, it's not a bad strategy. That's what it looks like. It has another great feature, which is snooze. If you leave a lot of unread emails in your inbox because you're trying to remember to get back to people, this one's great because you can snooze it by a day or later today or tonight or whatever, which is useful. And it'll pop back into your inbox at that point. Uh, Google Voice is also something that can be useful if you don't want to give out your actual phone number. Notice that I gave you guys my phone number. Oh, wait, it was my Google Voice number, right? So I didn't give you my actual cell phone number, but I can forward it to my cell phone. So you guys will still get me, but I know because of the number that's coming in that it's probably you guys, so I probably won't answer it. You get the idea, right? But it also allows you guys to text me and that sort of thing. So it's available if you want to. It's free from Google uh, if you want it. it. Lets you do text messages, et cetera. It also lets you keep the same phone number forever. So no matter what your phone is, you always have that particular phone number. So a little bit more, how are we doing? Yeah, I'll probably talk a little long today. Sorry about that. So architecture in the web. Let's talk through a little bit this, and I'll move a little bit quicker now. How the internet works. Anybody know how the internet works? Or do you even think about it anymore? It just works, right? OK. Well, it works because of things like this on the right, those server farms that exist that store all of our data. It's essentially remote banks of computers that fill up warehouses that make the internet run. There's a thing called a phone book in the internet world. It's the DNS system, the domain name system, that translates really random strings of numbers into things that we can remember. Okay? So let's say you wanted to visit apple.com, or you wanted to visit Apple. If you had to remember that to visit Apple, you had to type in 17.172.224.47. It'd be pretty hard to remember to go to Apple or to figure out who Apple was. But if you type in apple.com, yeah, that's pretty easy. Okay? So what this system does is it translates apple.com to that string of numbers for us, just like a phone book would. And by the way, if you guys are bored and you're tired of listening to me talk, you can type that in and it will actually work. You'll get to Apple. Okay? Just those strings of numbers. This is essentially the address of one of these servers somewhere in the world, or a bank of those servers, or in, in Apple's case, massive warehouses full of servers. But you get the idea. So we access all of this through a web browser. You could be using Internet uh, Explorer or whatever the Microsoft Edge browser is in Windows 10. You could be using Safari. You could be using Firefox. You could be using Google Chrome. And there's this other one called Opera that nobody ever uses, but I throw it up there anyway. Any one of these is fine. In the old days, Internet Explorer was like awful compared to everything else, and it's still pretty awful, but essentially any of the rest of them are all comparable. They're all fast. They're all good, um, et cetera. Some of them have some vulnerabilities that haven't been patched. Uh, Microsoft had a serious problem with something called ActiveX, which would let random people install stuff on your computer. They've obviously fixed that. Um, you can also get special plugins that block ads, for example, so you don't have to see ads, which is nice. If you're a, a web developer and you want to see code output and what's happening on various web pages, you can get plugins for that, which is useful. Uh, and then how fast is the browser? If they're all fast, it doesn't really matter. In the old days, when internet wasn't so fast and computers weren't so fast, it mattered which browser you picked because one was slightly faster than the other. It, now it doesn't make any difference. So use what's ever comfortable. So Wi-Fi. We all use Wi-Fi all the time. You go to Starbucks, you use Wi-Fi. You come to DVC, you use Wi-Fi. Believe it or not, 10 years ago when I started teaching here, Wi-Fi didn't exist on campus. There was no Wi-Fi. You'd come in with your laptop, you couldn't connect to anything. Weird. Wi-Fi, the question is, are you being safe when you're using Wi-Fi? Okay. So the thing about a Wi-Fi network, if it's a public Wi-Fi network, a la DVC, Starbucks, Panera, wherever you go, okay, if you're doing stuff that aren't on secure web pages, all of that information can theoretically be seen by somebody who's sniffing your traffic. 
okay? Now, do you really think that somebody at Panera sitting in the booth next to you is sniffing all of your traffic? Probably not, okay? Let's be realistic, probably not. Somebody probably doesn't have that much time and doesn't really care, but maybe. It's theoretically possible that somebody could be doing this. Certainly if they were trying to target you for something or if you were a high enough ranking public figure where there was some value in hacking your account, okay? So what you're working on, et cetera. The other thing that people love to do is they love to share files. Oh, I'm at home, I'm gonna share my files with my wife or my daughter or whatever. And then they come to a public hotspot and all their files are still shared. Well, if you're sharing your files and you change networks, your stuff is still being shared. So you can actually see, it's actually it's pretty funny. So I'm on the faculty network, which is separate from what you guys are on. And I can actually see a bunch of people who have, like these are faculty members who have computers that are open with stuff being shared. It's like I feel like putting a little note in their file, like guess what, I can see all your stuff. Anyway, it's kind of scary that people are this naive. So this is why I'm telling you about it, okay? If you go to your bank, let's say you're at Starbucks and you connect to your bank account, you get that little lock icon in the upper corner, that's an SSL encrypted connection. You're, they're not gonna steal your bank information, okay? So you don't have to worry about that part of it. The other thing is at home, if you leave your default wireless settings, they're the default settings. So change your passwords, enable encryption so that your account is locked, Right, the other thing is, let's say that somebody was being really malicious and they wanted to download pirated movies or something, and you lived in an apartment complex. Well, guess what? They're not gonna do it on their network. They're gonna look for the wide open network that somebody didn't secure and download it on that person's network. So if you, if you do this, you're not gonna get the DCA warning you downloaded the wrong movie or whatever that kind of stuff is, right? So avoid that by locking up your networks and obviously not doing it yourself on your own network. And if you really want to do it, do it on somebody. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm not advising that. What's a VPN? A VPN is a virtual private network. And I think this is a, a particularly apt conversation to have, or at least a thing to bring up, given the whole net neutrality. Some of you may be aware of this, right? The FCC passed a, a, a law or some whatever it's called that repealed a bunch of net neutrality stuff, which basically means that the content uh, providers or the, um, the bandwidth providers, the Comcasts and the AT&Ts and whatever, can decide what speed you can access various websites. So if they're in competition, let's say Comcast is in competition with Netflix, they can decide to slow Netflix down because they want you to use their stuff instead of Netflix, okay? So that's enabled. I don't think anybody's doing it yet, but theoretically it's possible. So what can you do about it? A VPN is a virtual private network. And essentially what a VPN does is it allows you to connect to a particular VPN server through your home internet connection. You get to that server location and then you access the internet from there, which gets you outside of Comcast having control of throttling your bandwidth or not. Okay? Sometimes it's done for uh, being anonymous. You want to be anonymous you might do something like this. Other times, maybe you just want to access content that's not available in one country over another. So an example here is uh, my father-in-law spends six plus months of the year in Ecuador um, working with some of the native tribes and whatever, and his SBC email account, he can't log into when he's down there. They block it. So he wants to be able to check his email, so he uses a virtual private network that pretends his computer, essentially, is in California, in which case he can get all his email. So it works to shift your geographic location. I'm gonna show you this in just a second. There's a few companies that, that offer it. You could do a Google search for it and find it. Private internet access is a pretty good one uh, that's out there that does, a, that does a decent job. So here's the, the traditional, my computer, it's unencrypted, and I go out to the internet. The example that we're talking about is you get an encrypted connection to their server location, wherever it is, nobody can see anything to that point, and then you go out to the internet from there. Okay, so let me take a quick break from the slides, and I'm gonna show you an example. So, okay, so here I am, and I'm using a, um, a, a web address called whatsmyip.org, and you can do this at home if you want to. Uh, and so I'm gonna refresh it so that I'm right now. And all I did was go to this website, and it's telling me that my approximate location is at Diablo Valley College. If I were to scroll down here a little bit more, right, it can tell me stuff like, this is my browser, I'm on an Apple computer. 
Uh, I'm using Chrome, this version of Chrome. right? And I can keep going down here, and I can see more information. Oh, guess what? I'm connecting through Diablo Valley College. Here is uh, how long they've had this domain. Uh, oh, here's some technical contacts if I wanted to e reach somebody, et cetera. So all this information is just because I access the internet from right here. Okay? So let's say instead I say, well, wait a minute. I'd really rather be in Australia right now, for example. So this is that virtual private network that I'm talking about. So I just connected to a virtual private network in Australia. I've encrypted my connection outbound. And now if I were to refresh it, same thing, maybe. There I am in Sydney. So now my access to the internet is essentially coming from Sydney, Australia, rather than coming from Diablo Valley College. So I just shifted my location to have that access. Okay? It's actually kind of entertaining if you switch, for example, to, to go to Italy. Oh, it's, it's an approximate location. It doesn't say specific address. So it's, probably, it's, it's roughly centered on where I am, just like the Diablo Co Valley College was roughly centered. I could have been in Concord somewhere. So I just switched to Italy, for example. We're going to go over to Milan in this context. There we go. And if I were to go to Google, just google.com, it's going to switch to the, uh, in this case, it's the uh, German version of Google. I don't know why they switched to German in this particular context. But the point is that websites respond to your geographic location. So now I'm accessing. So uh, in the old days when Spotify wasn't available in the US, it was only available in the UK, if you wanted to listen to Spotify, here's an example of how you could do that. Okay. So there's nothing illegal about this. There's nothing weird about this. It's something that is in practice that people tend to do. And so I bring it to your attention because of the net neutrality things that are going through. It's nice for you to at least be aware of it. Yeah. Exactly. And then I start to, like, okay, I live by connected to everything like that. So I go to the, the community then. But it all tell me, network will tell me you're using, like, a uh, proxy connected. Right. So, so it's, it's slightly different technologies. And we can get into this. I mean, I, I, don't, I can't spend the, a super amount of time talking about it. But they're slightly different technologies. The VPN is actually acting as though your computer exists in that country because your outbound traffic going to the internet is originating in that, comp in, in that country, as if you were actually in the building with that internet traffic. A proxy is a way of essentially saying, route my traffic through this other direction. It's a little bit different. It's not, it's not quite as encrypted. We could talk about it more uh, as we go forward. OK. What was the, the service, the first thing you recommended? This one is uh, uh, private internet access. Yeah, I think that's what it's called, private internet access. Um, I'll double check. Yeah, private internet access. OK, so onward we go. Thanks for that brief illustration. So I told you today's going to be a little long. The good news is the lab portion today is really short. So you guys will fly through that. OK, so bear with me. Passwords. OK, this is another kind of critical thing to talk about that if I don't talk about right now, chances are nobody else in your academic career will ever talk about it, unless you're in some kind of a computer class. So this is my one shot to convince you that you should be a little bit more secure. So Russian hackers now have 1.2 billion passwords that people have used. Well, guess what? If they have 1.2 billion passwords, chances are they probably have your password that you used. It's a lot of passwords. Okay? The average internet user has t at least 27 accounts. And they're only using six and a half passwords. How many people have less than six and a half passwords? Okay, no surprise, no surprise. Most normal passwords can be cracked by a computer in about 90 seconds. Okay, so what happens is if you were, let's say, Nancy, I was going to try to crack your password. Okay, I'm not, don't worry. But let's say I was, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to try all the known passwords before I try just brute force AAAAA. Because chances are it's one of those known ones. 
That's how I'd go about it. That's why you can crack passwords so fast. Now, of course, there's protections in place, and it's not quite that easy. Here's some more about passwords. One in 10 passwords is a name plus a year. Anybody fall under this category? Yep, OK. Two in 1,000 passwords is the word password. <laughs> Love is the most common verb in a password. 12 times more likely to have love in a password than hate. Kind of funny, right? Most, op uh, most popular adjectives, sexy, hot, and pink. <laughs> so the thing is, computers are getting faster. So they can crack passwords. They can try more passwords faster to see if they work. So in, in, in this particular example, if you custom build a PC with a bunch of graphics cards and you throw those graphics cards at it, uh, this particular computer can try 8.2 billion password combinations each second if you're trying to brute force a password. So you can see eventually it's going to get there. Now, could the NSA get there a lot faster? Yeah, probably. That's their job. Okay? The more passwords that are leaked, you always hear about these, oh, there was a security breach at LinkedIn. Everybody, you better go change your passwords. Okay? Well, that's fine, and nobody really hacked your account, and you know, all that's fine except that those passwords now exist. So if you use that password on some other website, you got to change it on all those websites because it's the same password. It's a known password now. So the more of these that happen, the more passwords that are out there. So you really only can be safe if it's truly a nice random character password. This is a picture of one of those password cracking machines, just for reference. It doesn't look like much because it doesn't matter. It's about the power more than anything else. OK, so here are a few other things. Passwords that can be easily cracked. These are the tricks that people used to use. Okay, That looks like a good password, doesn't it? It's mustache and then mustache spelled backwards. I don't think I can do it myself, because I don't think I can spell it forwards or backwards. But anyway, that forward backward, that's a known password. It's a known trick. The other thing is people love to substitute, substitute like, oh, I'm going to put a 3 in for an E or, or that kind of stuff. Well, that's pretty obvious, too. Right, these tricks really, they don't work. Any combination of these, you know, this is another classic one. You, you get the website and you type in your password and it's like, no, not strong enough. You have to use one of the random characters. So what do you do? You put an exclamation mark at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Guaranteed, everybody does it. Right? So do you think the, the, the people that are trying to get into your account know it? Yep. So they're going to try that. So OMG, I'm solutions. How do, you, how do you solve this problem? Well, number one, you don't use the same password twice. That's good. And you're saying, oh boy, this is starting to get complicated. Use a password that contains numbers, letters, and symbols. OK, that's good. Capital, lowercase, symbols. What's really annoying is the, when the websites won't allow certain symbols. I find that extraordinarily annoying. Anyway. Make the password completely random. The more random that password is, the better. OK, so we add these things up. Your life just got a lot more complicated, didn't it? Not practical. Yeah. So it's not practical. You're right. It's not practical at all. So what do you need to do? You need to use some kind of a password manager. It's the only way of doing it. So if you really want to be secure, you've got to invest in one of, these, one of these systems. If you're in the Apple world and you want to use their keychain, nothing wrong with that. In the old days, I had some issues about keychain. Now I think it's just fine. But you're stuck in the Apple world. You have to have all the Apple products. If you're not in the Apple world, then picking one of these is not a bad solution. Okay? So what these password managers essentially do is you create one strong random character password. You have to memorize it. It's really hard. But the more times you type it, the easier it becomes to, to memorize. After you have that master password that controls all of your passwords, and it should truly be random, no dates and years and all that kind of stuff, truly random. Then you use this to fill in all your passwords. So I couldn't tell you, in all honesty, if I went to my Gmail account and I tried to log in, I couldn't tell you if I have no idea what the password is. I know it's 24 random characters, but I don't know what they are. The only way that I know what they are is because this keeps track of it for me. And so all I do when I get to that Gmail page is I right click on it and say, put my password in. And it might ask for my master password, that one password that I have to remember. Or in the case of my iPad or my phone, I can use Face ID or my thumbprint or whatever to unlock it for me, in which case I'm barely thinking about it, because it's biometrically locked. 
So that's the, that's the solution. So if you use something like this, it keeps track of it, and it can allow you to have 300 different websites with, all with different passwords. That's secure. That's the way you want it to be. Furthermore, you want to increase the number of characters. So in my case, I said 24 random characters. I'm serious. I mean 24 random characters. My Gmail is locked by 24 random characters. My DVC account, the one that I actually have to type in, I've memorized this one because I type it in so much, is 25 random characters. Completely random. Stars, backslashes, it's all in there. right? And because I've typed it, I remember it, that one. In the beginning, it's really annoying because you have to pull it up and you have to type it one character at a time. But you will remember it. Maybe you start with less. But that's how you keep your accounts secure. The password manager encrypts the account, or encrypts all your passwords. So obviously, somebody couldn't see it. That would be bad. It should integrate with your computer, your iPad, all that stuff, so that it's seamless. It should be able to generate complex passwords. So you should be able to say, generate me a random 24-character password. That would be ideal. right? It creates separate passwords for each online account that you have. So you're not stuck with those same passwords over and over again. And it obviously should have a desktop version and a mobile version, because you want to have your passwords everywhere that you are. It's a little more cumbersome in the lab. That's the one place that it's more cumbersome. The other thing that's becoming increasingly common, you probably have to do this on your bank account now. Um, sometimes it's with other accounts. Essentially, you type in your password, and it says, oh, wait, we don't recognize the computer you're using. I'm going to text you a phone number, or I'm going to text you a code to, my phone, to your phone number, or whatever. It's a way of authenticating that you are, in fact, you. Right? It's, it's called two-factor authentication. It's really annoying. But it's also significantly more secure. Because if you were trying to hack somebody's bank account, you'd have to have their cell phone too. Here's some more articles uh, if you're interested in passwords uh, that you can have a look. So identity theft. Anybody had their identity stolen? All right. A couple of you. Guess what? I'm in the same group. Right. So you know I'm obviously kind of a stickler about this stuff. I wouldn't be up here talking about it if I didn't actually believe in it. I have all those passwords. I believe that my online accounts are very, very secure. There was one thing I didn't think of, though. And I'll tell you that in just a second. Nine million Americans have their identity stolen every year. Okay? 15 billion was stolen from 13.1 million US consumers in 2015. So you think this is common? Yep. It can happen to you. Okay? So if you're, if you're here, if you're in the digital world, make sure you use good passwords. It's a good place to start. This is the part that I didn't do. Guess what? There's a mailbox in front of my house. And you know what? That mailbox wasn't locked. So uh, this was two years ago. I got a call. Uh, I was on a job. I was texturing a ceiling. It was a terrible time to take a phone call. I got a call saying, hey, great. We just wanted to verify that you did want the uh, credit card. That you know, we, we signed you, you, you've made an application for a credit card. And we just want to make sure that, that, you, that you wanted it. Uh, no, didn't make that. And then I started to get really sketched out. And I was like, how do I know that you are Citibank calling me? Like, I don't, this is weird. So I hung up. And I called back, my bank happens to be Citibank. I called back Citibank. And I said, yeah, so somebody called me about a credit card application. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, we did call you about a credit card application. I'm like, I didn't make that. He's like, hold on, I'll transfer you to the fraud department. I'm like, OK, this is no good. So I, I wait on hold, get the fraud department. Yeah, so somebody did make that application. Let me pull up your whole credit report and let's see. Oh, you just opened a Sears credit card. You just uh, signed up for, what was it, four cell phones from T-Mobile. You signed up for another three cell phones from Sprint. You now have a Comcast uh, internet account in Houston, Texas. You, the list went on and on and on and on, right? All of it happened in about a week's worth of time. So of course, I went through all the stuff and locked down my credit and all, all that stuff so that people couldn't do it anymore. But for another two or three weeks, I kept getting calls. Oh, the big one? Yeah, I was approved for a $25,000 Discover card loan. Sweet. Yeah, ah, that 25 grand is going real well. No, I didn't have any of it. And the way that they did it, near as I can tell, is they took my mail. So what did I do? I went out and bought a locking mailbox and installed it. <laughs> Take that, right? 
But it, the, the truth is that it all was fine, and I filed the police reports, and I followed up, and I checked my credit score. Credit Karma, if you've never been there before, is actually great. And I know you guys, a lot of you are students, and you haven't really thought about any of this before. But as you get further along in life, and you have to buy houses and all of those kinds of things, this matters. So checking it, not a bad idea to at least understand where your baseline is. The biggest thing about this, I did, of course, I wasn't liable for any of the purchases that were made or the $25,000 loan or any of that kind of stuff because it really wasn't me. And I had proof. And they didn't want to believe me at first, but they eventually did. The thing about it is it was really annoying to suddenly have this burden placed on me. I had to make all the phone calls. I had to follow up with all these people. And on my credit report, it still shows that they have inquiries in Houston for internet accounts. And, what, I, mean, and I can't get rid of them. So it's a, just, it's a really annoying process that if you can save yourself from getting into it, all the better. So secure your mailbox, too. All right, creating your own identity. Okay, I want you to all take a break from me talking for just a second. I want you to turn to your computers, and I want you to do a Google search for your name. Anybody done this before? Yeah. This is the vanity search, right? Just your name. So how many of you actually find yourself in the first three results? OK, pretty good, pretty good. If you have a more unique name, that helps, OK? So it turns out that if you Google me, or at least last year when you Googled me, I died in a sunbed accident. I was tanning and I died. I didn't know that I was a little unaware of that. But anyway, Google informed me that that's what happened. The problem here is that if you don't actively manage who you are online, Google or one of the other search engines basically will determine who you are. And so if you don't think that you go to apply for a job and that person doesn't Google you, you're out to lunch. They're going to Google you. And they're going to try to see who you are. Furthermore, they're going to try to look on Facebook to see who you are because they want that extra information. It's all there online. Okay? So I ask you to do this to see if you're in one of those top results. If you are in one of those top results, great. You are who you are. If you're not, you might want to think about, how do I get myself into those top results? Yeah, Nancy. I'm dead. You're dead? Yeah, there's no Bummer. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the other problem. Okay, If you have a common name, it, it's, it's hard. So if you change and modify your search, so Nancy, in your case, if you took your search and you added industrial design after it, does that help? Maybe it does. So in my case, if you do Grant Adams and then you add architecture, you're going to find me. So sometimes you need that one extra uh, descriptor. But anyway, what can you do about getting yourself and branding yourself? Okay. So you could create your own website. You could buy a domain name and register it if you wanted to. All of that's certainly a possibility. Um, the thing about it is you have to decide what your name going to be. <laughs> and how do you, so, so if you can get your name, grantadams.net, I own that, that's me. Okay, cool, that's easy. But if you can't get your name, it's kind of problematic. So do you become a username? Do you have that pseudonym that's you? Do you use that across all the sites that you come in contact with? That's important too. Uh, we can skip through a few of these slides a little bit more technical than we need. Can you create a personal landing page, a page that is uh, designated to you that you control that shows all of your information on it that you can point people to? It's like a home page, right? I would encourage something that's independent of like Facebook or whatever so that it's actually a website. And you could put that on your business card or something, uh, which can be useful. So we're going to talk about personal landing pages. You're going to give it a shot today and see if you can make one for yourself. It allows you to actively manage your online identity. It also lets you claim sites that belong to you. So this is stuff that I'm doing. These are projects that I'm doing. Therefore, this is me. And you're pointing people to that. It also, has, shows, it also helps you control how the internet sees you and or how future employers see you. So if you have a personal landing page and you give him, you know, let's say you're applying to or for a particular job and you say, here's my website and they go to that website, here's all the stuff about me, it saves them from going to Google and trying to find you. So you're controlling that dialogue. So we're going to use something called pixelhub.me, hopefully. I used to use some, uh, a web page called flavors.me, which was awesome. It was great. 
they, they went out of business. So, so we're not doing them anymore. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, Google Plus is another alternative, but to me it's kind of Facebook-like, um, which isn't necessarily the best thing in the world. So what do you do? Essentially, you want to shift yourself into creating content and then cross-posting that content. So you're associating what you do with who you are. And the more you do that, the higher your rank is going to get into Google. So a little bit more on privacy, a little bit more on Facebook. I'm not a huge Facebook fan. I do have a Facebook account. Um, but it's not something that I'm particularly fond of. And that is because if somebody or you post something online about yourself, let's say it is the, um, let's say you went and you did the uh, beta breakers and you might have had a really ridiculous costume on and you might have had a little bit too much to drink and all of the rest of it like most people who do beta breakers tend to do and you posted a bunch of those pictures on your Facebook account. Well, number one, as soon as you post them onto Facebook, they exist. Facebook has them, so you can't control. Even if you delete them, technically they still have them, so you don't have control over them anymore. But two, that employer that you're trying to get a job from in a year is going to go to your Facebook page and say, oh boy, did he have fun. Might not be the best thing, right? I am so thankful that when I was an undergrad in college, digital cameras didn't exist. <laughs> I didn't have any of that to worry about. You guys, unfortunately, have all of that to worry about. Not only that, all of your friends have a little phone in their hands that are going to be like, oh, you look silly. Click. Right? And then that picture exists. And if it gets posted to Facebook, it's a problem. So you just want to be aware of this stuff. If your friends post it to Facebook and tag you in it, there's not a whole lot you can do. Okay? But you do have control over what you post. And it's important for you to think about that because it lives on two, three, five years from now, it's still there. And you just want to be aware of it. Nancy, you had a question? Is there a way to make them take it off? Not really. I mean, yes, you can try, and you can try to get them to do it. But technically, they still own it. I mean, there was a time where there was a bunch of um, user agreements that actually said Facebook owned whatever you posted on your account. I think they've changed it now, so they don't technically own it. But you know, you're trusting Facebook. Or you know, I mean, I'm picking on Facebook right now, but it doesn't matter. You know, pick. Pick whoever it is that you're uploading things to. Technically, they have some rights to it. So you want to be aware of that. Um, and if nobody else tells you it, somebody has to tell you. That's why I'm telling you, right? The other thing you can do if you have a specific domain name is you can set up more custom email. So you can say grant at digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. It's a more personal email address. It's certainly a more professional email address. Now might be a good time for you in college to think about what's an appropriate email address. So, you know, sexyhotmama123 at yahoo.com <laughs> might not be the best thing to give your future employer. <laughs> you might want to, you know, grant.adams at gmail.com. That might be a little more professional. So think about, right? I mean, you, we were all 16 once. We all had our first email account. You know, it probably wouldn't have been sexy hot mama, but you know, whatever it is, it might not have been, you know, it might have been like I love my little pony at gmail.com. <laughs> I don't know, you know, I'm trying to think of what my daughter would pick, you know? Or or, you know, uh, Anna's so cool or what you know, whatever. Anna and Elsa 2013 at gmail.com. I don't know. You know, those kinds of things, right, are something that you do when you're a kid. And that's okay. But now you're in college and it's time for you to start making yourself a little more professional. And so you might want to think about that now versus trying to think about it in four or five years when you're trying to apply for a job and you don't have a track record of having another email address. Just food for thought. OK. Uh, of course, you can set up domain-specific email. This kind of stuff doesn't really matter. There's Google Apps, whatever. The key is that you want to get away from having to do much other than posting cool stuff. right? You create good content. You post good content. You associate that with your name. People find you. That's the ideal world. That's what you want. So one other thing that we're going to talk about today, and that is LinkedIn. I'm not big on professional networks. Do I think LinkedIn is a little bit spammy? Yes. But do I think most employers right now are kind of have an expectation that you're going to be on LinkedIn? Yes, I do. It's kind of become that. So today, you're actually going to work on your LinkedIn profile as part of your exercise. A lot of you already saw that. Uh, if you don't have one, you're going to create one. If you already have one, you're going to update it and make sure that it's current and has your current information on it. Because when you go, to apply for a job, they're going to ask for this. 
right? So it's just one of those things that you might want to be aware of. If you want to be friends with me or whatever it is on LinkedIn, connected, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that, OK? So we're going to work on that a little bit. And um, as part of today, we're also going to work on a personal landing page. And remember, everything that we're doing is going to stop at 1030, which gives us a little under an hour to finish. The computers, fingers crossed, will reboot. And then we'll log you all in for the first time and hopefully the last time of all that setup stuff. Okay, so make sure you are here in your seats at 1030, but make sure you're not doing anything on the computer at that point. You can just kind of hang out and look at your phone. See, it's the one time I can tell you that, right? You can look at Facebook on your phone or Instagram or whatever it is that you guys do now. Okay, are there any questions? I know it was a lot of information today, but this is my catch all. This is all the stuff that I want to tell you about that I don't get to tell you about any other time. Fair enough? All right. So we'll take, um, Let's go like a 10 minute break since I talked for so long. Uh, and we'll come back at 9.40 and I'll walk you through the various things that we're going to do. <laughs>